The title of Dr. Jensen's talk is, What Does It Mean to Be a Human Being? The Mistaken Identities of Nation, Race, Gender. Please welcome Dr. Robert Jensen. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, everybody, for coming out, for giving me a, an excuse to get out of Austin <laughs> for a little while. Uh, I was especially glad to, I'm, I'm willing to go anywhere where there are souls to be saved. <laughs> <laughs> and I was told that in Kerrville, <laughs> especially among the Unitarians, was, some souls needed some saving. So maybe we'll get to that. Maybe we'll have an altar call at the end. Y'all do an altar call? <laughs> no, it's, forget it. I'm in the Unitarian. Uh, listening to uh, all this, it, it made me realize this is a very ambitious talk, a very ambitious subject that we're going to take on this morning. I'll try and do it justice and leave a lot of time for discussion. Um, let me tell you how I came to this question, what, it, what does it mean to be a human being, which is of course one of the central questions of philosophy forever. And, and the books that Richard mentioned sort of helped me organize my thinking on this. So uh, in the last decade, uh, we're coming up, of course, on the 10th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11 and all that unfolded afterwards. Um, I started trying to think through uh, these questions and, and wrote about them. So this first book, Citizens of the Empire, The Struggle to Claim Our Humanity, was about politics on a global scale post 9-11, especially from the point of view of someone who's a citizen of the United States. And in doing talks about that book, I came upon what I thought was a nice little line. I said to audiences, you can be an American or you can be a human being, but you can't be both. And by that I, I meant not that you should renounce your citizenship if you're a, an American, but that if you embrace all the mythology and the ideology around what's often called American exceptionalism, this notion of a special place in history for the United States, perhaps divinely inspired that if you embrace all of that mythology, you will surrender part of your humanity. And so this phrase, you can be an American or you can be a human being, captured that notion for me. And people seemed to respond to it, and so it worked. So I just adapted it. So when I would talk about race, this next book, The Heart of Whiteness, trying to look at what it means to be white in a white supremacist society, I would say, well, you can be white or you can be a human being, but you can't be both. That is, you can embrace all the mythology and ideology around whiteness and white supremacy, or you can be a human being, but if you embrace that notion of being white, you will surrender part of your humanity. And that worked pretty well. So when I would do talks about gender in the context of this work, critical work I've done on pornography and men's violence, I would say, you see where this is going, you can be a man and embrace all the ideology and mythology around masculinity. Or you can be a human being, but you can't be both. You'll surrender some of your humanity if you embrace that notion of being a man. Well, those were nice glib little statements. I, they were nice ways to end the talk. Uh, but it does leave a question unasked and unanswered, which is what does it mean to be a human being? If we're going to reject these, what I call these mistaken identities around nation and race and gender, if we're not going to see ourselves as Americans or as white or as men, if we're in privileged positions in a system based on illegitimate authority and an unjust distribution of wealth and power, if we're going to reject all that and claim our humanity, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a human being? And as I said, that's a question that's occupied philosophy as long as there's been philosophy. But I want to address the question very much in the context of the moment in history in which we live. What does it mean to be a human being, not in the abstract, but in this particular moment, given the realities of this moment? So what I want to do is step back and, and try to describe what I think this moment looks like try to offer an analysis of why we're in the position we're in, and then pose some questions, I think very difficult but very important questions, about how we're going to respond to it. 
So let me start by talking about the historical moment in which we live. It's probably true that people always think the moment they live in is the most important moment in history. <laughs> probably the, the, uh, the nature of being human. But I do think that even with that caveat, I think this is the most important moment in history. <laughs> and the reason I say that is not, I, I don't think, arrogance or a sense of self-importance, but the reality. I don't think we've ever faced in human history the challenges we face today. So let's describe those challenges. I would group them in two categories. I would call these questions of social justice and questions of ecological sustainability. That at this particular moment, with seven billion people on the earth, we face two profound sets of questions. One set of questions around what we typically call social justice, the way that wealth and power are distributed within the human family. The second set of questions are around ecological sustainability, the place of the human family in the larger living world. Now, it's fairly easy to, I think, sum up some of these challenges. Let's look first at social justice. I'll offer you one statistic that I think is extremely compelling. According to the World Bank, you all know the World Bank, one of these global financial institutions, not exactly a radical organization, very much in line with contemporary power. According to figures from the World Bank, about half the world's population lives on less than $2.50 a day US. So let's take a moment and ponder that. Half the world's population, that is more than 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. That's $2.50 a day for everything. Food, shelter, medical care, education, everything. That means half the world's population lives on less than what many Americans this morning will spend on a fancy cup of coffee. That means half the world's population lives in abject poverty with not act, with act, without access to the minimal means necessary for a decent life. Now let's remember, every one of those more than three billion people, according to our philosophy, Unitarian philosophy, any philosophy, have exactly the same moral standing as every other person on this earth. We all are essentially the same. Yet half of us live without the resources to live an even minimally decent life. That is a crisis of social justice that is hard to really, I think, get a handle on. That single statistic describes the world in which we live today. A distribution of wealth and power that is fundamentally at odds with everyone's moral principles. And I don't just mean Unitarian moral principles. We understand that Unitarian moral principles are supreme, are the, the, the ultimate fulfillment of the human condition. We know that. But even those lesser beings who have not yet signed on to the Unitarian train have principles. And I don't care if your, your principles come out of a theological or a secular system. I don't care what religion. If you look across the board, every decent human community today will advocate some basic principles around the inherent dignity of all people, the need for solidarity and a kind of rough equality. All of these are pretty basic principles. You see them in Christianity and Islam and Judaism and secular Western philosophy. You see them everywhere. And this one statistic reminds us that we are living radically out of sync with our own principles. Not the principles that I want to impose on you, but your own moral principles. The moral principles of everyone, essentially. That's the state of the world in which we live. The inequality at the heart of this is growing. It would be one thing if we lived in that condition and inequality was rapidly being narrowed, but in fact, it's not. Within the United States, inequality is growing. It's grown for the last three or four decades. Worldwide, it's growing. So we have a crisis within the human community, a crisis of social justice that is deepening as we speak. That's the good news. The bad news is on the front of ecological sustainability, where the news is even grimmer. Here I'm not going to offer you a single statistic. I'm going to simply suggest that no matter what statistic you look at on the question of the health of the ecosystems that make our own life possible, and I don't care what statistic it is, you can look at questions about topsoil loss, groundwater contamination, actually dramatic changes in the hydrological cycle, the size 
the number and growing size of dead zones in the oceans, the dramatic loss in biodiversity, species extinction, resource scarcity, and of course, the, the big one, not global warming, I don't like that term, but what I would call climate disruption. Look at any statistic that tells you something about the health of the ecosystems that make our own lives possible, and the news is bad across the board, without question. There have been some minor improvements in specific places due to things like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act in the United States. You can find rivers that are cleaner today than they might have been 30 years ago, places where the air quality has improved slightly, but those are very minor and very local. On a global scale, the planet is in crisis. That's the reality of, that's the historical moment we live in. A profound, profoundly unjust and a fundamentally unsustainable world. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of this is entirely unique, but this degree of um, social injustice and ecological unsustainability, I think, is unprecedented on a planet with more people than ever before. Okay. Now, what does that mean? How do we start to make sense of that and especially make sense of the institutions that we live in that might be responding to that? Well, here I would say that we live in multiple cascading crises. Mm -hmm. That we are dealing not with one problem in one system, but multiple and therefore cascading crises. Let's review them quickly. The political crises. Uh, democracy has always been an incomplete project for all our waxing eloquent of a democracy, especially in the United States, we know that we've never lived uh, in, in a truly democratic society. And I don't mean some ideal, I mean even in rough terms, we've never lived in a truly democratic society. And I would suggest that that incomplete project is in fact losing ground. Uh, that while we have the formal institutions of democracy in place, and that's not trivial, um, that, in fact, the sense of a democratic culture is not deepening, but is, in fact, starting to fray. And you see that all around. One of the reasons for that, quite clearly, is the relationship of the political to the economic. We don't just live in a democracy, a republic based on democratic principles. We live, on a republic, we live in a republic based on democratic principles within a predatory corporate capitalist economy. Now, what does that mean? Well, we know that in capitalism, there's one thing that is consistently true. Wealth will be concentrated. Capitalism is a wealth concentrating system. It has always been so, and it will always be so. <coughs> Forget about what they try to teach you in Economics 101. That's all mythology. The reality of capitalism, as it has existed on this planet for the two, 250 years of the system, is that it is a wealth concentrating system. The concentration of that wealth is growing as we speak. Now here's the obvious thing that you don't hear about much. There is a relationship, obviously, between a political system and an economic system. A political system doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in a world, and part of that world is the economic system. And I know of no example in history in which you can concentrate wealth and not concentrate power. Wealth and power are related. A wealth concentrating system will result in the concentration of power. In other words, capitalism will undermine democracy, and that is, in fact, the story. You add to that an incredibly sophisticated propaganda system available, which is a phenomenon of the 20th century. The development of advertising, marketing, public relations techniques that really are unlike anything we've seen in history before. Marry that to this concentration of wealth, and you see that the political system is in trouble. That's one of these crises I'm talking about. The economic system is also in trouble. And I don't mean here just the concentration of wealth. That's been an enduring feature of capitalism. Capitalism has always been a fundamentally inhuman system in the way that it concentrates wealth. But now capitalism itself is in fact on the decline. And I don't mean that we're just in a 
cyclical downturn. I think all of the evidence suggests that capitalism has been going through these cyclical downturns and we are now in a period of permanent decline. That the contradictions of the system are such, the literally the insanity of the system is such that we are now living through the end of that particular way of organizing an economy. You can see that just in the way that the reaction to the 2008 financial crisis has done nothing but exacerbate the underlying problems that led to the crisis. So instead of taking stock of the inherent problems in a so-called free market system, we've simply decided we're going to repeat the mistakes and therefore deepen the crisis. So there's a political crisis. We're losing our capacity to function in democratic fashion. There's an economic crisis. The system that defines the world economy is in free fall. And let's add to that what I would call a cultural crisis. Here, uh, I sometimes am accused of sounding like a conservative, but if one is going to tell the truth, one has to accept such slurs. Uh, I think we're living in a cultural crisis. Now, you heard that I studied the question of pornography and men's violence against women. Uh, and that's one of the places I think it's most evident. But you see it across the culture, that this is an increasingly corrosive culture, a culture in which empathy is increasingly difficult. I study the pornography industry, which is one of the, what I would call the sexual exploitation industries. Pornography, prostitution, stripping, the ways that men routinely buy and sell women's bodies for sexual pleasure. When you look at the trajectory of those industries, it's not a pretty picture. When you look more generally at mass-mediated pop culture, it's not a pretty picture. When you look at the routine ways in which especially women's bodies are objectified and bought and sold, not only in these specific sexual exploitation industries, but in pop culture more generally. When you look at the routine acceptance of violence in pop culture, I think what you're seeing is the erosion of our capacity for empathy. When you see that people who are living in this incredibly corrosive, intensely mass-mediated culture, and you see where that is heading, I think what you see underneath it all is the erosion of our capacity for empathy. And that's the worst of the news in some sense. Because when human beings lose the capacity for empathy, when we lose the ability to look at another person and understand what it might be to be that person, then I think we're really looking at the end times. Not in the sense of Christian fundamentalist dogma about rapture. Don't worry, I'm not going to move into some, some, some sermon about repentance. And whether you arrive with the Lord Jesus Christ and whether or not when that day comes. Now, I'm not going to go down that road, but I think there is Something to be learned, and I, and I want to sort of conclude this part there by, by actually thinking or actually asking us to think about whether in that rapture eschatology, all that discussion that you've heard from the conservative Christian community, taking the book of Revelation as some sort of guide to the future. Okay? Uh, on the surface, it's, it looks to me like uh, that's pretty crazy. And I think it is. I mean, I don't subscribe to that particular theology. But what's underneath that doesn't seem so crazy to me. The notion of end times. The notion that this particular phase of history, in fact, might be coming to a conclusion. And we might want to think about that. Not because there's some mystical, magical event that's coming down the road, but that, in fact, the systems in which we live, in fact, might be grinding to a halt in some ways. All right. So. That was the happy, upbeat portion of the talk. Let me now move into the, the dismal. <laughs> All right. Bear with me here. Uh, essentially, what I'm suggesting is we're, that we're failing as a species. This is not an insight new or original to me, of course. People have often commented on how uh, the human being with the big brain with the capacity for critical self-reflection and cognition beyond that which we at least understand other animals to have, it has allowed us to intervene into the world in ways that 
no other species has been able to and allowed us to dominate the planet in ways no other species has been able to. But it has also created the conditions that might undermine our own ability to continue living in the sense that we understand it. So we fail in some sense. I think it's important, just as it's important for individuals when we fail to acknowledge it. Because, of course, there is no way to transcend failure until you've admitted it. I think that's a, a reasonable suggestion for us as a species as well. But I do think we also should understand why we've failed. Why have human beings made such a mess of the planet, both within the human community and in relationship to the larger living world? And here, I want to go easy on us as a species, right? Because, in a sense, I, I, to borrow a phrase from a, a, an author I really appreciate named Wes Jackson, who has done ex incredibly important work on sustainable agriculture, Wes refers to the human species as a species out of context. The modern human, the, 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 the animal that we are for the last roughly 10,000 years, right, has been a species living out of context. We've been living under conditions that we did not evolutionarily adapt for. So let me take a minute to explain that, because I think the context is very important. Let's remember that Homo sapiens, human beings, people anatomically indistinguishable from us, right, have been on the planet about 200,000 years, roughly. There are, of course, hominid precursors that go back millions of years, but if you go back 200,000 years, you would find human beings who are indistinguishable from us except they probably might be a little more civilized in certain <laughs> senses. <laughs> okay. So, in that 200,000 years of our evolutionary history as a, as a species, let's remember that for 190,000 of those years, that's 95% of our evolutionary history, for the vast majority of the time the modern human has been on the planet, we lived in small band-level societies that survive through gathering and hunting. 95% of human history is band level society, small, probably no bigger than 150, one anthropologist argues. That human communities in that context never really got above about 150. And we survive by gathering and hunting, not through the domestication of plants and animals, not through that intervention into the ecosystem, but simply by adapting to the ecosystem around us. So for 95% of our evolutionary history, fan level small societies gathering and hunting. Okay. That's who we are as an animal. That's what we're adapted for. Living in small communities and living in the ecosystem in a rough kind of balance. Okay. To say that isn't to romanticize gathering and hunting or you know, prehistory. It's not to make it into some sort of idyllic Eden. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that's what we are. That's the context in which we evolved. And that's the way we're built as an animal. Right? Because I believe in evolution. Y'all, the Unitarian Church accepts evolution. This is like, okay, good. Well, you never know. Even in Texas, you outlier Unitarians who have not yet. But I think the whole Unitarian Church is on board with Darwin at this point. That's good. Okay. That means we are living out of context. We are living not in small band level societies, and we are not living in a gathering and hunting context. We are living in large scale societies, and we are living off of the domestication of plants and animals. So we are no longer living in human communities that we were designed to live in, and our relationship to the Earth is dramatically different. And now we are dependent on this, given the seven billion people on the planet. So we are trying to make the world work in contexts that we did not evolve to make work. That's why big institutions, for instance, fail. That's why we live in bureaucracy. If, think about it for a second. If we lived in context, there would be no bureaucracy. There's no bureaucracy in a gathering and hunting tribe. You don't fill out forms. You, know? you don't report to the appropriate division to get approval to report to the other appropriate division to get approval to do something in a gathering and hunting band. Right? All of this is evidence of a species out of context. And of course, this dramatic intervention into the ecosystems through the domestication of plants and animals set in motion the ecological 
problems we talk about. So we're in trouble because we're not facing the problems we have in a context that we're evolved to succeed in. That's why I think it's very important to recognize that we are a species out of context. That means that these very, very crucial questions we face, we face in a sense with limited skills. And so what I want to do now is talk about the way I think about the two central tasks in facing these problems. How we need to think about addressing these systemic problems. And I'm going to talk about the need to balance. And I'm going to talk about the, the challenge we face that in some sense certainly no other species has ever faced and in some sense human beings haven't faced until very recently. Two tasks, two fundamental tasks that we are going to have to deal with if we're going to take seriously this notion of being a species out of context. One is the fact that our band level, let's call it a tribal past, right, the conditions under which we were formed as people, now plays out on a global scale. That we are going to have to learn to balance the tribal and the universal. That's the first one. I'll come back to that. The second is in doing this, we need to develop a sense of righteousness, but balance that with a sense of humility. These are the two fundamental tasks if we're going to make sense of these challenges we face. So let me say a bit more about that. When I say we need to balance the tribal and the universal, we need to recognize that we function best at the very, very local level. So let's take this, this number of 150. It's called Dunbar's number. Robin Dunbar is the anthropologist who has looked across <coughs> time and community and suggested that the natural level or the size of a human social group is about 150. That's about as many people as you can know before the group gets so big that you lose track of people. Okay. That's what we're adapted to function in. Okay. And that is where we are going to return if we are going to make sense of the world. We're going to go local. Right. There's no other way to do it from my point of view. But at the same time, we have to recognize that given human history, we now live on one planet. And unlike the band level societies of the past, we have an understanding of ourselves as being part of a global society. And especially those of us who live in the first world, which has been enriched by the exploitation of other parts of the world, half a planet away, we have a moral obligation to think globally. So we have to train ourselves to think locally, to think in tribal terms, while we balance that with our need to think globally in universal terms. And nobody, no, nobody's ever had to do that before. Nobody's had to think clearly about what it means to create human communities that can endure, that have the bonds to endure at the very local level, at the same time recognizing your role on the global scale. That's a tough one. <laughs> It's easy to think about falling back and organizing your life around the local. But to do that and abandon the obligations to the global, I think, is unacceptable morally. So we're going to have to learn to balance that. That means to me all of the institutions that are in the middle of that, things like the nation state, are probably going to get in the way. That, in fact, we're going to have to understand ourselves in this very local way as citizens of, of, of the world. And all of these other things are probably going to get in the way of us being able to do that. So we've got to rethink who we are in political terms. And that's not going to be easy. All right. The second thing is to take on all of this, to really be serious about this, you need a sense of righteousness. I don't mean self-righteousness. I don't mean arrogance. I mean a sense of righteousness that the, the analysis you've come to of what the problems of the world are is fundamentally correct. You know, I don't mean without <coughs> challenge, but that you have to have some sense that you're looking at the world in a sane and rational way and you've come to reasonable conclusions. And you have to be willing to fight for that, especially when you're going against the grain of the dominant culture. So you, to, to do this effectively, you have to have that sense of what I'll call righteousness. Right? 
But the problem is, we see that when human beings have a sense of righteousness, it often leads human beings to engage in incredibly destructive behaviors. Because when you're pretty sure you're right, it's very, very easy to engage in activity that undermines other people or the larger world. So we have to balance this sense of righteousness with a deep sense of humility. Because we see what the consequences of hubris, of arrogance are. They're that inequality within the human community and that destruction of the living world. It is human arrogance and hubris that leads one group of people to subordinate another out of a sense of their own righteousness. And it is that same arrogance and hubris that leads human beings to intervene in the living world as if we can control everything and leads to the ecological unsustainability. So we've got to balance this. We've got to stay true to this passion we have for social justice and sustainability, but we have to always remember that we could be wrong. In fact, we probably are wrong, at least in some aspects. And that's a tough balancing act as well. Okay. Now, none of this is truly unique to this moment in history. Human beings have been struggling with this kind of thing for a long time. And that's where I think the stories, especially the stories in religious traditions, can be useful. So let me just offer one out of the Christian tradition that I come out of. Uh, and that's the story of the garden in the Hebrew Bible. Okay? You all know it. Adam, Eve, they're there in the garden. Things are rocking and rolling. Everything's good. And God says, you got these two trees. You have the tree of life. And you have what's often called the tree of knowledge. But remember, it's not the tree of knowledge. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, the tree of life, eat freely from the tree of life. It's yours. But that knowledge of good and evil, that tree, stay away from, that's dangerous. All right. Now, traditional theology, and especially conservative theology, spins all sorts of crazy stories out of the garden. Right. I don't agree with those. Right. But that's, stories are meant to be interpreted, and, and the discussion and argument around that interpretation is important. So let's offer a different way to think of the story of the garden. Right. The command to people right, from God. And, and of course, I'm talking now not about God as if there's a God up in the sky and you know, Adam and Eve are real people. These are all stories. They're, sy they're symbolic, they're metaphorical. We use them to try and puzzle through our place in the world. One way to read that story of the garden is to say that the forces of life, the, the larger forces of life that govern creation, right, they have a workings that is beyond human understanding. Right, that as much as we peel back the frontiers of knowledge and science, we don't really understand how this world works. It is complex beyond our capacity. And the command, if one respects those forces of life, is to not meddle in them. The tree of life will provide, as it provided for all of, almost all of human history. Gatherers and hunters ate freely from the tree of life. And in some sense, they never got too close to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They never thought that they could control that larger system. That changed about 10,000 years ago when human beings started domesticating plants and animals, the invention of agriculture, which is usually dated to about 10, no more than 12,000 years ago. When human beings first looked around and figured, ah, we can play God. We can not only eat from the tree of life, we can not only take from this larger living world, but we can intervene in it and control it. That's what agriculture is. And ever since then, it's been downhill. Right? <laughs> ever since human beings started the business of agriculture, we have been degrading the ecological capital of the planet. That was intensified dramatically in the industrial era, especially the post-World War II era with the introduction of petrochemicals. Uh, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides that allowed a dramatic intervention into the world. But basically, ever since human beings have been doing agriculture, we have been ruining the world. Wes Jackson, who I referred to earlier, says, the plow has done more damage to the world than the sword could ever do. Right? Yeah. All right. But what is that? What's behind agriculture is that notion that we are God. 
Essentially, when human beings broke the soil and started domesticating plants and animals, what we really were saying is, listen, we can play God. We can intervene into this complex system and manage it. And guess what? We've learned from the last 10,000 years that we can't manage it. That we're, the, we're extremely clever beings. Right? We have this big brain, 1,350 cubic centimeter brain. It does amazing things. I mean, think about it. We're sitting here, electric lights, the computer. Oh my goodness. It's easy to get drunk on the capacity of the human brain. But the human brain is profoundly ignorant. And for all our cleverness, we are still thousands of times more ignorant than we are knowledgeable, which is why we do things to intervene in that natural world that we can then not control. We can't see the consequences of our own interventions. We're not wise enough. We're clever but not wise as a species. And I don't just mean individuals who overreach. I mean as a species. And that's where we're stuck. But those stories are there. From the beginning of the tradition, those stories are there. Watch out. It's hubris that gets you every time. And those stories are in all of the traditions. And that's one of the reasons, I think, these religious traditions are important if you can shed the supernatural, the very childlike desire to believe them to be accounts of supernatural phenomena instead of simply being life lessons. So, to wrap up, uh, you kind of figured out there's not going to be a happy ending, right? I mean, I'm not one of those speakers that goes, all of these challenges are in front of us, but we can gather our collective resources. We can overcome. We can transcend. We can find the promised land. The New Jerusalem is there, I see it. It's vast, it's in the distance, but it's there. Brothers and sisters, come together. I, sorry, there ain't no happy ending, folks. All right? Because there's no guarantee. Unless you are really committed to supernatural claims about the inevitable success of the human being, which is the most insane supernatural story of them all, but somehow, because we want there to be a happy ending, there will be. Think about your own lives. Is willing a happy ending, wishing it into existence, been a good strategy on the individual level? No. And there's no guarantee it will on the collective level. There is no guarantee that the human species is going to figure this out. In fact, if you look at the data, if you just look honestly at the state of the world, it's not only that there's no guarantee, you could even come to the conclusion that there's no possibility of it. That the, the problems we're talking about, especially the ecological crises, may well be beyond the point of no return. I mean, there are tipping points in, in, in systems. And we may well be beyond the tipping point on everything, including, most dramatically, climate change. Right? We don't know for sure, but it's certainly a reasonable conclusion to reach. So there's no guarantee of victory. There might even be no possibility of victory. Which is a way of saying the human species might be an evolutionary dead end. Right? <coughs> Other species had their time and passed. There's no guarantee that somehow we live in perpetuity. So the real question is, if you are intellectually honest, that is, if you look at the world, look at the data, look at the systems out of which the conditions under which we live come, <coughs> how do you keep going in this quest to create a more just and a more sustainable world? Well, there's always, you know, heavy drinking. Uh, not one I would recommend, although it does at least have some short-term efficacy. It works. Right? But if you're talking about being committed, it's got to be a commitment that does not depend on the inevitability of success. Right? And I think that's what my answer to the question, what does it mean to be human, is. It's to endure with no guarantee of success. It's to hold on to that empathy, that ability to understand what it means to be another person, especially someone suffering under conditions that you might not ever have to face yourself, and continue to commit. And the reason that it's important, I think, to, and this is where I'll conclude, important to be honest about the state of the world is because if you tell people a story as an organizer that they should commit to, let's say, a social justice cause or an ecological cause because we're going to win, because within your lifetime, 
you're going to see significant success. If you pitch to people involvement in these causes based on an assertion of success, I think that's a losing game because I don't see that success coming anytime soon, right? at least in the short term. And I'm 52 years old and I count the short term as the, the remainder of my life. Right? I don't see that there's a lot of hope for dramatic success. That means if people are going to stay committed to causes, it's got to be for a reason other than the assumption of short-term success. And I think the reason, especially for those of us who are in positions of privilege, and let's face it, I'm, I'm sitting pretty in the, in the privilege game. I am male in a world dominated by men. I am white in a world structured around white supremacy. I'm an American citizen in a world still to a large degree dominated by the United States. I'm educated and have a job that puts me comfortably in the professional class and materially comfortable. As a friend of mine always says, Jensen, if you'd been born good looking, you would have had it all. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest part about that is the person who always tells me that is my minister. <laughs> I think it's his attempt to instill a little bit of that humility in me. So what would lead people who sit on top of that privileged pile to engage in such struggles. It's because that's the only way you can, in fact, claim your humanity. To sit on the sidelines in that struggle is to surrender some of your humanity. So the best answer I can come up with to that question, what does it mean to be a human being, is simply the struggle to retain that empathy and stay committed to projects that with no guarantee of success, at least make it possible to imagine success and in the meantime, bind us together in the kind of human communities that we hope someday will be the norm on the planet. So with that, uh, I've been told that this is a quiet, demure group that never has any questions. So we can just break now and go to lunch. 